your life for discussion at the moment. One cannot imagine anyone turning on a radio today, be it an old or an ultra-modern set, without remembering Guglielmo Marconi, its inventor. Whether in Italy or abroad, all Italians are proud of the fact that it is thanks to him that one can communicate wirelessly from one corner of the earth to another. But there is no country better than Ireland that can claim stronger ties with Guglielmo Marconi for Ireland gave birth to Guglielmo's mother and to his first wife. Marconi was born on April 25, 1874, in Pontecchio, 15 kilometers from the city of Bologna, the second son of a marriage between a wealthy Italian landowner, Giuseppe Marconi, and Annie Jameson, of the Irish whiskey distillery family. As a child, Marconi was a loner, with manual dexterity and a passion for inventing scientific toys, for taking things apart and putting them together again. Unlike his older brother Alfonso, Guglielmo was a taciturn young man who spent hour after hour in the loft of his house, Villa Griffone, constructing and experimenting with strange gadgets using pieces of wood wires and glass vials. His father Giuseppe was quite worried about him, but his Irish mother Annie encouraged him in his experiments and in learning English and reading the Bible. But it wasn't only the Bible that the young Marconi read. He was also interested in reading scientific magazines, which his cousin Henry Jameson Davis sent him from London. His intense interest in electromagnetism and the possibility of wireless communication became his obsessive fascination. He was energized by other wireless explorers, particularly Faraday, Hertz and Maxwell. He started experimenting within a few yards in his attic, increasing to a few hundred yards in his backyard. Not scientist, thought there was any commercial viability to his pursuit, but Marconi, who had a head for business too, proved them all wrong. When in 1895, at the age of 21, following laboratory experiments at his father's country estate at Pontecchio, he succeeded in sending wireless signals over a distance of one and a half mile his destiny to greater things was well assured. From that moment on, Marconi's transmission experiments multiplied, covering locations on the four corners of the world. He had discovered and developed the concept that wireless waves were not affected by the curvature of the Earth, and this was the turning point towards radio transmissions as we know them today. With radio, the world became smaller and safer, more varied and open for every set of ears. Marconi's private life was to some extent a roller coaster of emotions. From his first wife, Beatrice O'Brien, daughter of an Irish lord, he had three children, but the marriage came to an end with an amicable divorce in 1924. In 1927, he married Italian countess Maria Cristina Bezzi Scali, from whom in 1930 he had a daughter called Elettra. Elettra was also the name he had given to his yacht, which he used as a floating experimental radio station. Marconi was simply adored by Maria Cristina and his lovely daughter Elettra, who unfortunately could enjoy her father's affection for a short time, for Marconi died when she was only seven. Reading a book entitled Marconi, My Beloved, written by Maria Cristina and edited by her daughter Elettra, one gets the distinct feeling of this great love. 
This carefully documented and quite moving book traces the highlights of Marconi as a scientist, husband and father. In 2003, Elettra, Marconi's only surviving child, summed up the importance of her father's achievements in an interview to Italian radio in Rome. I would like to talk about my father's very early years when he had the great idea of using electric waves for the benefit of mankind. He was fascinated by the subject of electromagnetism and made experiments all by himself. He studied a lot in Villa Griffone, his family home. He studied mathematics, physics, chemistry, and made experiments with and created gadgets using rudimentary things. But he was a very practical and creative man, and he always felt the urge to save human lives by transmitting signals which might inform people and call for help especially at sea, where he saw so many ships without any contact with the mainland. He was quite concerned about this, and by working very hard since his early teens, at the age of 21, he achieved just that. In Ireland, the links with Marconi are innumerable. For a start, it is more than a coincidence that within the grounds of RTE, the Irish National Radio and Television Broadcasting Company, stands Montrose House, where Marconi's mother, Annie Jameson, lived. I'm an archivist here with RTE, the Irish National Broadcasting Service. I'm standing here on sacred ground with regards to Marconi, because behind me, Montrose House, part of our headquarters, is where Annie Jameson lived, the mother of Marconi. Many remember that in 1898, Marconi after successful demonstrations of his system in England, traveled to Dublin for the annual Kingstown Regatta in Dunleary Harbour, where he demonstrated the practical value of wireless communication. Marconi installed a wireless transmitter on board a tugboat, the Flying Huntress, and he transmitted the progress of the boat race in Morse code for the benefit of the Daily Express newspaper which printed the results in a special edition. Three years later, at the beginning of the new century, in the year 1901, two coastal wireless stations were established in Ireland, one at Crookhaven in County Cork and the other at Rosslare in County Wexford. These two stations were located on the southern edge of Ireland but before long, Marconi's interests and stations in Ireland were dotted all around the coastline. It is important to remember that in 1912, messages from the doomed Titanic were received by an Irish radio officer in a distressed situation. And although many died, without Marconi's equipment, almost everyone would have perished. In 1916, Thanks to Marconi's invention, the Irish Republicans broadcast a call to arms from the General Post Office in Dublin, which they had seized during the Easter Rising attempt to secure independence from the London government. 
This wireless broadcast on April 25th and 26th, 1916, is claimed by the Irish as the first wireless broadcast in the world. There is one place, Cliffnan, on the western coast of Ireland, that has arguably the strongest links with Marconi. In 1905, at Derry Gimla, three miles from this lively and prosperous town, Marconi set up a station with a gigantic condenser which allowed perfect tuning to its transmitter. By 1907, this station was the most advanced station of its kind in the world. Well, the Marconi station, which was in operation in Derry Gimler from 1907 until 1925, was extremely important to Clifton, to the very early years in, of the century here in Clifton, principally because of the number of people that it employed, and this brought a tremendous benefit to the local economy. When the station opened on the 17th of October in 1907, we were at the time under British rule, and this was a very very poor area, very poor region with very little employment and very high immigration. And so when the company came in here offering employment to large numbers, you can imagine it was very welcome. And then when the company closed down in 1925, we were at the time a free state, but even then the economy in the area wasn't terribly good. So the closure of the, the Marconi station was very much regretted and was a great loss to the area. We're on the site here overlooking Derry Gimla which was where the Marconi wireless station was located. Just behind me here is a monument that was erected to Alcock and Brown. They were the two flyers who flew the Atlantic. They, they landed at the Marconi station on the 15th of June, 1919, having successfully completed the first non-stop transatlantic flight. Um, just behind me is the location of the uh, station. You can see it in the background. It was a very desolate site, and it is today pretty much as it was when Marconi chose it in 1905. And here we are on the old Marconi site. Now, I have a great uh, affection for Marconi because both my father and grandfather worked at the old Marconi site. And uh, they started there in 1905, and they worked up till the very end, 1922. And uh, in the background, you can see the old condenser uh, station, and uh, the main Marconi station was building was right across there beside the lake. And now uh, you can see in the distance, um, the water tank is there, it's quite visible at the moment, where they got the water for the station to cool the boilers, because all the boilers are situated there on the, the main building. And um, my father uh, used to tell me, I used to come along here back in the 50s and on a Sunday, and we talk about Marconi and the great man that he was. And uh, that's why I have a great love for Marconi all the time. Now, for the last couple of years, I've been on the bog down down the, the valley, and I was cutting my turf, and I used to meet all the visitors, and I met an awful lot of people from all around the world, and especially from Italy. They even left a letter in my book there to explain to me that they were Delighted to see that both someone remembered Marconi to this day. Hello, my name is Ender Broderick and I represent the Irish Radio Transmitter Society and the Galway Radio Experimenters Club. We're standing here today at the Marconi station in Clifton, uh, where we can see here on the wall a plaque that was unveiled by his daughter Electra in 1995 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of uh, wireless radio. To, uh, around us here uh, we have the original Marconi radio station in Clifton and as a radio, ham radio operator we actually celebrate the birthday of Marconi on the 25th of April or the closest weekend to it each year and this year is very special to us. We have the 100th anniversary of the first commercial transatlantic communication between Ireland and Nova Scotia uh, which our club is putting on a special event in uh, October to commemorate uh, Marconi's achievements. The magnificent Abbey Glen Castle Hotel in Clifton was the venue of great celebrations in 1995, which marked the centenary of wireless radio. Inside the hotel, editorial memories of this celebration are preserved, and there is no better person than Paul Hughes, the hotel owner, to talk about it. I was president of the Clifton Chamber of Commerce back in 1995. 
The Marconi celebrations were certainly the highlight uh, of my presidency, which lasted for three years, and also the highlight of, of my many, many, many years in Connemara. Beautiful, beautiful, stunning weather. Uh, the excitement when we finally made contact with Princess Electra in Rome, and subsequently, because of that, the Italian ambassador at the time came along, and it, it snowballed and snowballed. Then we heard that the, uh, the Admiral Admirilio, Ad Mario Maguala was coming with the Zephyr, the big Italian warship, with the whole Marconi uh, exhibition on board, and the huge helicopter, uh, naval helicopter, which would bring all the VIPs to and from Abbey Glen. The excitement in the town when we collected uh, the Princess Electra, that's Marconi's daughter, from the airplane in Shannon, and we drove her up with our friend Princess Colonna. We stopped en route, stunning weather, in a big long limo with the chauffeur and the Italian flags as well flying out of it, and a big reception on arrival in Clifton, and I was danced with her even, Electra, one of my happiest memories. And then the whole town got together, uh, we had a parade, a, the whole Chamber of Commerce formed a, a guest of honour, and also there's a, we bagpipes and horses and carriages going around the town, she unveiled plaques both in Clifton and out on the Marconi site. We danced and celebrated all night long, she did various interviews from her room overlooking Clifton and the village. The huge, we're so proud of our huge claims to history that Marconi made us first trans transatlantic link from Clifton to Cape Breton in Canada. From here, we arranged, uh, the Clifton, as President of the Chamber of Commerce, arranged for Marconi, to, his daughter Electra, to go in and meet with uh, the lots of people in Galway over various functions, four major functions in Galway. The first was she met the radio ham, you know, the amateurs learning to do radio. Uh, then on one other evening, we had her in at the GMIT, that's the university dealing with uh, this radio technology, and she made a huge presentation here, brought the show down. And also, uh, we brought her to City Hall. She's made guest of honor and conferred on with great honors and things. And, uh, and lastly, it was a great occasion when the Zephyr came into Galway City, tied up at the docks and the big a uh, formal official luncheon up in the Admiral's qu quarters, or the Captain's qu Court, and the Admiral was there also, and uh, we had a lovely luncheon served on board. And ironically, at the time, my cousin was there, uh, John Coyle was chairman of the uh, Harbour Board, and he was at the table as well. And there's only about ten of us, but it was a fantastic, fantastic occasion, which is... I will live with and cherish with, and so will the people of Clifton live with and cherish forever and ever. The celebrations of the centenary of Marconi's radio continued in Dublin, where at the Italian Cultural Institute, a commemorative stamp issued by the Irish Postal Authorities was officially launched and presented by Paddy Clark, who contributed to its design as an expert on Marconi. From Clifton in Ireland, to every and each corner of the world, the memory of Marconi commands great respect and inspires great affection. Loved by his family and offspring from his first and the second marriages, Guglielmo Marconi packed quite a lot into his 63-year-long life. And when he died in 1937, Italy and the world lost an absolute icon of inventiveness and tremendous achievements. Together with physicist Enrico Fermi, Marconi was arguably the greatest Italian scientific mind of the 20th century, the genius who gave a voice to silence. He received accolades and honorary recognition all over the world. He was bestowed the noble title of Marchese, and above all, at the age of 35, he was one of the youngest Nobel Prize winners in the world.